Okay, welcome back everyone to our second lecture today on BC 308, Revelation and Daniel. We are going to start with Daniel chapter 8. Um, is there any question or any questions about the previous chapter, Daniel chapter 7, before we move forward into Daniel chapter 8? Any questions on Daniel 7? I hope. It is clear, things were clear. Um, one of the things um, that is useful to do is as we are reading Daniel, uh, it is good to map it with other, other scripture texts, primarily Book of Revelation. Uh, you know, then you can see, okay, what was said here in Daniel 7 is given, you know, it corresponds to what God unveiled to John. And more details are given there. We can match the two. It makes things so much clearer. All right, let's now go into chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8. So what we saw in Daniel 7 is four beasts, four kingdoms. From the fourth kingdom, from there arise ten leaders, ten horns. Then there's a little horn that is speaking pompous things about God. Then God himself intervenes, he removes that little horn, and, 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 and then there's the kingdom of God set up, and the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High. Now, Daniel chapter 8, let's read it first. Uh, we'll do the same thing quickly. We will read, uh, you know, three, maybe three verses, two, three verses each, and then we will again look into the meaning of what we read. Let's start. Daniel 8, verse 1 onwards, please. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel. After the one that appeared to me the first time, I saw the vision, and it is so happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the the Kitadel, the kita which, is, which is in the province of Alam, and I saw in a vision that I was by the river Alai. Then I lifted my eyes and I saw there standing beside the river was a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one was, the higher one came up last. Amen. Let's onwards, please, Come on. I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him, nor was there any that could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male god came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the god had a notable or horn between his eyes. Then he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing beside the river, and ran at him with precious power. Verse 7 onwards, someone. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against him, attacked the ram, and broke his two horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very quick, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Was nine Go ahead. Out of one of them came a little arm. This was deliberate towards the south, towards the east, and towards the glorious land. He grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the hosts and some of the stars threw down the ground and trampled upon them.
verse 11. He came to us. He, he, he came to us. Even as great as the place of the host, and the regular bond of friends was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown, and the host which was given over to it together with the regular bond, often because of transgression, and he threw truth to the ground, and he act and prosper. Verse 13, Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to that certain one who was speaking, How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For two thousand three hundred days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. Okay. Uh, should I continue? Yeah, go ahead. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. Verse 17, someone. Verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Now, as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground. But he touched me and stood me upright, and he said, Look, I'm making known to you. What shall happen in the later time of the indignation? For the appointed time, the end shall be. Verse 20. The ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia, and the male god is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eye is the first king. As the broken horn and the and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. Verse twenty three. And in the later time of the their kingdom. When the transgressors had reached their fullness, a king shall arise, having fierce features, who understands sinister schemes. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He shall destroy fearfully, and shall prosper and thrive, and shall destroy the mighty and also the holy people. Amen. Verse 25 Verse 25 to 27. Through his cunning, he shall decide to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in, in this heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. Afterward, I rose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Yeah. Right. So, here we are. Daniel chapter 8. Again, God is uh, revealing to Daniel things that what we call as near term. That means some of this happened right then. 
and some of this is in the latter time, which is long term, far away. Right? So both are there. Right? Things that happen near term, and some in the latter term, God's revealing. So he's seeing two animals. First is a ram. It is moving west. So it's rising from the east. It's moving west. And this ram has two horns, but the second horn is bigger than the small horn. And he explains to us within this chapter what the ram represents. He says in verse 20, the ram which you saw having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. Okay? Kings of Media and Persia. So now we are going to map everything, right? In chapter 2, we saw the image, four parts. First one we know, Nebuchadnezzar. Second, he told Medes and Persians, chapter 5. He's already told us. Okay. Then, chapter 7, we saw the lion, then the bear. Bear mapping to Medes and Persians. Now, we're coming to chapter 8. We're seeing the ram. And the ram is also Medes and Persians. So, it's all in line. Right? The chest of chapter 2. The bear of chapter 7. And the ram of chapter 8, all representing the kingdoms of the Medes and the Persians. He's giving us more details in chapter 8. He says there'll be two horns. The little horn and the second one is bigger. So that actually historically happened. The Medes were the little horn. So they, were, they, they came into power but for a short while. But then the Persians, they are overlapping. They're coming from the same region. Uh, the Persians were more powerful. So Persia is the Bible term for what we refer to modern day times. It is a country of Iran. So Medes and the Persians, people from that region, Iran, uh, the empires that came from there, they moved powerfully and they were extending themselves toward moving west right so they came were moving west from iran and moving west towards the, the mediterranean they conquered turkey parts of that region they were moving that side so that's the rap medes and persians history history tells us that and uh, we also know that the first Persian king, King Cyrus, was the one who sent the Jews back to go rebuild their city and the temple and all of that. So that's the role they played. Did God use it? This Persian king, Cyrus, you know, after the Medes, Persians, God used him to carry out a purpose that he wanted, which is to send the Jews back and rebuild the city and the temple. And as I had mentioned, as a prophet, as I had called by name King Cyrus, which is a Persian king. So Daniel is seeing the ram moving west, representing Medes and Persians. Now, as they are moving, they're moving strong, suddenly something happens. One goat comes. And he says here in Verse 21, Daniel 8, 21. The male goat is the kingdom of Greece. Okay, so Daniel is so amazed. I mean, see the amazing prophecy because now there are, Daniel is prophesying about four kingdoms. You know? the Babylonians, Medes, Persians, now Greece. is Greece. So the goat, he says, this goat comes, the Greece. Uh, kingdom of Greece. So we're talking about the coming up from in and around the, the, uh, Greece, uh, Greece, the Greeks. And he says, this goat has one, one horn, very powerful. And the goat is moving east. 
So from Greece, the empire is now extending eastward. So conquering the eastern part of Europe, crossing over the Mediterranean, crossing over into Turkey, moving all the way, all the way to Iran. And we know that, uh, so he's saying the, 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 this goat had a very big horn. And the horn is its first king. Verse 21, the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king, the large horn. Is the first king. Who's the first king? Alexander the Great. Okay, how we know? Looking back at history. So Daniel 8:21. Daniel actually prophesied about Alexander the Great. He didn't call him by name, but he's mentioned here. He is the first horn, first king of the kingdom of Greece, the goat. And we know literally Alexander the Great uh, was the first king from Greece. The, of the uh, Greek Empire, he moved very fast. So he's saying this goat is, like, is moving in such a such speed, he's not even touching the ground. He's moving and he literally expanded his kingdom so forcefully, so fast, all the way he, to India. So can you imagine from Greece, he's moving east, he's extending all his kingdom all the way across you know, conquering Iran, Iraq, all the way till India. But something happens. Daniel said that uh, this is in uh, verse 8, Daniel chapter 8, verse 8. The male goat grew very great, but when he became strong, the large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. So what's happening? He's becoming great. So that means he literally he expanded his kingdom very fast, but he suddenly died. And this is history. Alexander the Great suddenly died at a very young age, at, in his early 30s, something like that. So very great king, the, the, the goat moving east, extended its kingdom. The first king was moving very fast, but he suddenly died. And then what happened? Four of his generals, his generals, began to uh, to control over four portions of his kingdom. Again, this is history, historical. But Daniel already said, verse 8, Daniel 8, verse 8, and in place of it, four notable ones came up. Right? Uh, Daniel 8, verse 22, as for the broken horn and the four that stood up in its place, four kingdoms shall arise out of that nation, but not with its power. That means out of the Greek empire, after Alexander the Great died, what happened? No immediate leader, his four generals took four portions of his empire and they ruled, but they did not have the same power that he had. That is Daniel 8.22, fulfilled, history, historically fulfilled. Now, the four portions of his empire, broadly, generally speaking, covered the regions of, of Greece, and Eastern Europe covered Turkey, uh, covered which modern modern day Turkey, covered modern day Syria and uh, the regions in that area. That's all along Israel and uh, along uh, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, that area, and another part in Northern Africa, Egypt, and so on. So broadly speaking. So four regions, four emperor, uh, generals were ruling or governing four portions of the Greek Empire, very broadly speaking. But why is this important? Because Daniel said, verse 9, out of one of them came a little horn. Similarly, uh, 
verse 23. So the four kingdoms will happen. So that is the near term history. Verse 23. And in the latter time of their kingdom. That means now he's moving. He's going to the latter time. The end of the end times. In the latter time. Verse 23. And the transgressors have reached their fullness. The sin is abounding. A king shall arise. So that's the little horn. So Daniel chapter 8 is telling us in broad terms where the little horn or whom we know as the Antichrist is going to come from. He's going to come from one of these four regions that belonged to the Greek Empire, which was ruled by the four notable ones. That means the four generals who belonged to Alexander the Great. So one of these four areas, the little horn or a king shall arise in the latter times. So that's why we, uh, of course, we don't know the exact country because these are regions and these countries didn't exist during that time. So we are looking very broadly at Eastern Europe, Greek and the other small, small countries around there because that was one portion. We're looking at Turkey, which, is an, which was another portion. Turkey, of course, has a big land, land space. Then we're looking at another third region, which is Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Iran, Iraq, all that region. And then we're also looking at another portion, which is Northern Africa, Egypt, and so on. Because Daniel said, verse 9, Daniel 8, verse 9, out of one of them, out of one of the four regions, the little horn came. The Antichrist, the king who speaks or who does all these evil things or speaks against the Most High. The Antichrist comes from that region, is what Daniel said. So we're not specifically saying it will be from Greece or Turkey or Syria or Egypt. We're just saying these, from, from modern time, these are the regions. But remember that there are more countries in these regions uh, which were governed by the four generals of Alexander the Great. And then he tells us what this little one he giving, is giving us now more details about what this little horn will do. Now, in chapter 7, he said he's going to speak pompous things against the Most High. I mean, he's going to be blaspheming God. That was uh, Daniel 7. And he's going to make war with the saints. Daniel 7. Daniel 7. He's going to change times and law. And for three and a half years, a time, times and half a time, he's going, uh, the saints will be given to his hand. That means he's going to, it, God is going to let this Antichrist, this man, Antichrist, really torment or uh, attack the saints. God's going to let that happen. Right? That was chapter 7. Now, in chapter 8, he's telling us more of what this little horn will do. Right? Verse 10. Uh, it says here, uh, verse, verse 9, sorry. Out of them, that is out of these four, one of those four regions, came a little horn, that's the Antichrist. He'll grow exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. That means he's going to exert influence. So this little horn is coming up. His influence is going to extend over the south, southern part from wherever he, whichever country is coming, in the south, towards the east, more of Europe, and toward the glorious land. That means over Israel. I mean, this little horn. God's going to let this happen. He's going to exert influence over this region. South, east, and the glorious land. That's verse 9. And he will even grow to the host of heaven and cast some of the, verse 10, Daniel 8, 10, some of the stars to the ground and, and trample them. That means he's going to, uh, as is explained later, he's going to speak against God, against things of God, 
is going to have so much influence on on the stars now when we talk about stars stars represent uh, uh, we will see in revelation 12 represent the nations of israel i mean uh, the, the the 12 stars revelation 12. so stars you're reading about stars to the ground revelation 12 the woman the sun the moon the 12 stars 12 tribes it could also represent uh, his influence is empowering from the spiritual realm right he's demonically empowered by the dragon this man so he's exerting influence he's speaking things against the host of heaven god and angelic thing angelic beings he's going to he's supernaturally empowered by the beast and demonic powers he's attacking the people of israel verse 10 verse 11 sorry dan late 11 he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host that is against you know we see later on he, he's talking about the prince of princes but that's in verse 25 he is exalting himself against the lord jesus christ right? the prince of the host the prince of all the angelic hosts or the prince of princes he's exalting himself against the lord jesus and then verse 11 he's going to do something more and by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of a sanctuary was cast down now that brings giving us more insight which was not given in chapter 7. This Antichrist is going to do something. The daily sacrifices and the sanctuary. Now, we do not know. Sorry, that's the motorbike going inside here. Right now, the temple in Jerusalem is not there. So on the Temple Mount, there are two uh, Muslim structures, Arabs, you know, there is the Al-Aqsa Mosque and there is the Dome of the Rock belonging to the Muslims, it's sacred to them. But it's built on the Temple Mount. That is where the Temple stood. And today the Jews can only come to the Western Wall, pray there and go. But here in Daniel chapter 8, verse 11, he's saying, the daily sacrifices and the place of a sanctuary. The sanct place of a sanctuary doesn't exist right now. The temple doesn't exist. So this is why we say that the temple has to be rebuilt for these prophecies to take place. Because right now, they're not able to do the daily sacrifices. So, as we will see, we will go as we progress in chapter 9 and so on. What, what will the plan that, that unfolds is this little horn is to the help of, by him influencing three of the ten leaders who are part of this European Union, he's going to come into power. In fact, he's going to be supported by ten leaders. We will see that later in Revelation uh, 18. He's going to be supported by all 10 of these leaders, but he's, he's coming in his influence by taking control of three of them. He's going to come to power. He's going to come as a man of peace because he will sign a covenant of peace for seven years. He'll establish this peace treaty. Uh, so it's very likely that as part of his covenant of peace, this sanctuary will be rebuilt and the daily sacrifices reinstituted there on the temple mount. It's not very likely, it should happen because the temple being in place and the daily sacrifices happening is part of what is going to, you know, it's foretold. So today, that temple mount and of course the relation between Israel and the Arab nations, a very, very, uh, say, very uh, big conflict, big problem. 
and nobody and people are trying to find a solution right they say okay two state solution you know, palestinians should have their own land and so on but somehow this man of peace seems and according to what we're seeing in scripture and daniel and revelation he seems to be able to broker peace for seven years a seven-year peace treaty and this is what brings him into power he's able to come because nobody else is able to do it a lot of people in the past have tried a lot of presidents have tried they tried Let's make peace. Nobody's able to do it. But this man of peace will come. I mean, this man will come. He will be able to broker peace. And the temple has come back into its place. Daily sacrifices are reinstituted. And then the same man, in the middle of the seven years, he's going to break his covenant. He's going to change. So he's establishing a covenant of peace. But in the middle of the seven years, he himself is going to change times and laws. We read about that in Daniel 7, 25. He will change times and laws. He put it all in place. Seven years, you'll have peace. Middle of the seven years, three and a half years, he will change it. And it says in verse 11, Daniel 8, 11, By him, the daily sacrifices will be taken away and his sanctuary will be cast down. And he will desecrate the temple. We will see more details coming up, chapter 9 and also in the book of Revelation, more details. And also in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Right? But that's what he'll have. And because of the verse 12, because of the transgression, and he's going to do very evil things. It says an army was given to him to oppose the daily sacrifices, he will cast truth to the ground. He did all this in process. He, an army will be gathered. There are going to be people, uh, nations, armies, kings who will support him. So that he'll have this military power to do this. Nobody can stop. An army will be given to him to oppose the daily sacrifices. So I'll do this. Nobody's going to stop me. We'll see who will stop me. Because he'll have this. Right? So Daniel then asks the question, this is uh, verse 13, you know, hey, can you tell me about the time? How long will this be? And when, how long is the daily sacrifice going to be stopped? And the transgression of desolation is going to, you know, make this sanctuary desolate. And, um, and the giving of both the sanctuary and the, uh, and to the, and the host to be trampled under foot. When is this going to happen? When all this will be desecrated? So, how long? That's verse 13. Then he says, verse 14, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now, 2,300 days, uh, want us to understand it as he explains in verse 26 as evenings and mornings. Okay, a day as evenings and mornings. And so, uh, 2,300 evenings and mornings uh, divided by 2 is 1,150. 1,150 days. which is about three and a half years. You do divide by 365, it'll come 3.15. Now, it's a slight, I mean, it's not exactly three and a half. It comes to you know, something in that range, three point some days. Just keep in mind that there is a difference between our Gregorian calendar and the Jewish calendar. In uh, how many days are in a year, uh, the number of days are slightly different. But verse 14 must be understood with verse 26, because he says, the vision of the evenings and mornings. So it's an evening and a morning. So these 2,300 evenings and mornings. And you will find a footnote 
of verse 14, you'll find he's actually talking about 2,300 evenings, evening mornings. So you divide by two, so that you, that's the number of days. And the number of days is about three and a half years, calendar year. Slight difference between Gregorian and Jewish calendar, so uh, approximate. So what he's saying is, But three and a half years, which is the second half of the tribulation, the daily sacrifices will be stopped and the temple will be desecrated. That means the first three and a half years, the sacrifices are happening, the temple is there, the sanctuary is there. Then, second half of three and a half, the second half, second three and a half years, daily sacrifices will stop, temple is desecrated. And after that, 2,300 mornings and evenings, which is 1,150 days or three and a half years, then the temple will be cleansed. That is the millennial temple, which is the Antichrist will be taken out of the way, everything will be cleaned out, and there will be a, a cleansed, a cl clean temple, consecrated temple in place. So, we are seeing more details about what this little horn will do. He's going to speak blasphemous things and so on. And uh, we pick up here again, we're seeing uh, a repetition of this from verse 23 uh, to verse 26. Right? He says, this is going to happen in the latter time. Right? So this is after the Medes, Persians and Greek, all that has happened. Then there's a time gap. Then in the latter time, this king will arise. Right? So remember, see, there's a time gap between the ram and the goat happening and the, you know, the four notable ones ruling all that. That's happening. That's the near-term prophecy being fulfilled, which historically has happened. Then there's a time gap. We'll, we'll see the time gap being explained to us in Daniel chapter 9. And then verse 23, Daniel 8, 23, in the latter time of their kingdom, so this is going to the, towards the end of time. This king will arise. Verse 24, he will do all kinds of evil things and he will prosper. Uh, verse 25, he's very cunning, very deceitful. He'll exalt himself. He'll destroy many people. He will rise against the prince of peace, princes. I mean, against the Lord. But he's going to be destroyed, not of human means, but God is going to destroy him. Verse 26, the vision of the evenings and the mornings, which is what we were talking about. He says it is true, and it refers to many days in the future. It's talking about things way out into the future. This is Daniel chapter 8. Is it clear? So we are adding little by little, you know, to what we started in chapter 2, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 8. Information is being added. More details are being given. And that will continue in chapter 9. We'll see more, more details. Any questions, please? Go ahead, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, here, uh, I just uh, want, uh, wanted to know, like, the Roman Empire is not at all mentioned in this particular vision, right? And in the first uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream, um, it was said that it is a revised Roman Empire, the iron, the feet of iron and clay. Uh, so, but here uh, it's not mentioned, but it's jumping from the Greece uh, Greek, uh, Grecian Empire and saying that there will be four notable kings that arise out and in the latter times there will be a little horn. So mm. I'm just confused between uh, does Greece and Rome uh, where they're geographically ruling over the uh, uh, like Grecian Empire and Roman Empire they were geographically ruling over the same areas is that's what meant here, or um, or is it like the uh, the 
the system will come or the person will come out of uh, this empire or yeah i was just trying to understand mm -hmm. yeah you're right in the sense that um here the focus is on um, the oh, i think definitely to mute um, so the focus here is on the Medes, the Persians, and the Greek Empire, and where this little horn is going to come from. Um, so that's the focus. So obviously, the legs of iron, or the fourth beast, that kingdom is, you know, is is not mentioned here. Uh, so there is a, he explains to us about the Medes, the Persians, the Greek, and that this little horn that we read, but remember the little horn is actually coming from after the fourth kingdom, fourth kingdom happens. It's coming from the loosely held I remember the ten horns are actually coming from the the feet, the loosely held territory of iron and clay, then the ten, ten toes, or from what belonged to the fourth beast, fourth kingdom. From there, the ten horns come, and then comes this little horn alongside. So, in timing, this little horn is actually in timing. It is all along with the ten horns. Then the little horn comes. So in timing, it's there. But he's pointing to the territory from which this little horn is going to come. This little horn is going to come from one of those four regions that belonged to the Greek Empire, which was then which was ruled by the four notable ones from who came after Alexander the Great. So that's the, the main highlight here. Where this little horn is coming. So, as we understand chapter eight, we keep the framework, we keep the outline, which is you know there are these four kingdoms mentioned, and then the loosely held what we call as a revived or the revived Roman Empire. Uh, we keep all that in mind, and also remember the little horn is coming along the same time as the same time as the ten horn. So, in time, that's when it is, but. The focus in chapter eight is where is this little horn coming from the Greek Empire? To answer your question, the fourth empire, the Roman Empire, was much bigger than the Greek. So the Greek Empire started out from Greece and moved eastward all the way to India. The Roman Empire extended from Spain all the way to uh, it, did, it didn't go all the way to India, but uh, all, all the way to, uh, we would say, you know, just around Iraq, Iran, covered all of that, that Iraq part, covered there, and then extended south to the northern part of Africa. So it covered most of Europe, across the Mediterranean, and uh, into the uh, Northern part of Africa. Let me see if there's, there's this map that included it. Yeah, yeah, I'll just show it to you here very quickly. It's in that PDF. I'll just share it. Yeah. So here we, here we can see that the colored part, the colored part is the Roman Empire at its greatest extent. So you see, this is, you know, Spain. It goes in, covers all of. Uh, uh, part of Europe, it didn't cover all of Europe, but the major part of Europe, um, uh, Italy, uh, and then cover, coming over here, this part, uh, and then extending over to what would be modern day Turkey, coming over here, so here's Syria, and coming over here, but here's where Iran, Iraq would be there, and this is where, you know, right now there's a lot of conflict going on, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Egypt coming up there. So this is where the Roman Empire at its greatest extent. The Greek Empire was more from Greek on towards east, towards here. Okay. 
Yeah. Should I ask? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I had just uh, like one more question. Uh, the in this vision uh, is uh, our ram, the goat, all these representing the empires. But then when it comes to the little horn, it goes down. Does it go down to a you know a system, a world system, or does it go down to a person? Because in uh, even in the uh, vision, uh, we see that the personal pronouns are used even for ram, goat, uh, mm. and even for the little horn. So I'm trying to understand whether it is a, a system of like a world system or is it a person, the little horn? Yeah. So in these, uh, in, in both the prophecies in, uh, you know, Daniel 2, 7 and 8, the the beasts, the images, uh, the animals, they are representing kingdoms, right? So he tells us here, you know, for example, if you look in Daniel 7, uh, he says here, um, uh, Daniel 7, 17, those great beasts, which are four, are four kings or kingdoms which arise. Again, he says here, Daniel 7, 23, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom. So the beasts represent kingdoms. The horns represent kings. We see this in verse Daniel 7, 24. The ten horns are ten kings, right? So prophetic imagery. Beasts representing kingdoms. Horns representing kings, which would be individuals. So that's how we are interpreting this. So the little horn is actually a little king, an individual who is speaking. The animals, the beasts and the goats and the ram are representing kingdoms or uh, yeah, empires. Sure, sure, Pastor. And uh, one more question. Like in verse 8, when it says four winds of heaven, does it have any particular meaning or it's just four directions south, the, uh, like north, south, east, west, just like that? Or does it have any meaning? Yeah. So uh, he, here we will talk, we will say, okay, he came into uh, influence. It's almost like. So when we talk about the winds, winds of heaven, it's like God is moving. God is operating this, is causing these things to take place. But also in terms of, you know, uh, uh, he's, he's going to, uh, God has got the four winds, meaning God is moving on the earth, causing these things to take place. Because we're being consistent with what we said there in chapter 7, verse uh, 2, the four winds of heaven. Or stirring on the great sea, meaning it's this is the move, you know, like God is orchestrating a lot of these things. Similarly, here, these four notable ones uh, are being uh, God is, has orchestrated, God has put them in their places uh, and, and causing this thing. So, like the four winds, generally, you'd say is like God moving on the nations, on the seas. We understand it from that perspective. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. I'll just answer quickly one question here in the chat. Uh, Rosalind, can you give a scripture reference for the seven years peace city, which will be signed? So Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 27. Daniel 9, 27. He shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Right. So I will explain in our next class. A covenant is a peace treaty. One week represents seven years. We will look at it next class, Daniel 9, 27, which is then also we will see in Revelation. Uh, we'll also see this in Revelation, how uh, there is this understanding of two portions of three and a half years, which it make up seven years. We will look that look, look it up in Revelation 7. So this, uh, we will, you know, this peace treaty, seven years, we'll look at it in chapter 9. Okay. So let's pause for uh, today. I'd encourage you to just read through chapter 7 and 8 and try to understand it. And any questions, we'll pick it up next week and then move forward chapter 9, 10, so on. Okay. Thank you. Well, somebody could close in prayer, please. Okay.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day uh, where we learned uh, so many things. Jesus, God, I pray that you will help us to understand the things, go back, revise, and help us to know the truth. We thank you for Pastor Ash, who is teaching us all this. And I thank you for every single person who are here, Jesus. Uh, as we are drawing near to the end of time, God, you equip us in a way where we will stand bold for your kingdom, Jesus. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name and pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day, and we'll see you again.